Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the studio for the penultimate episode in the saga that's been this sculpture. Today we'll be sculpting the eyes of Kronos, which is of course a very important part of this piece, or any piece for that matter. Let's get into it. As you can see, I've left the eyes for last. I normally tend to do this. Sculpt eyes too early and they often end up in the wrong place I find. I like to get the skull structure and especially the eye sockets well situated before beginning the eyes themselves fully. Some really simple general rules that you can follow in regards to the placement of the eyes. The eyes are placed in the middle of the skull in height. When considering the overall width of the skull from the front, you can usually fit five eyes into this width. The inside corner of the eyes line up with the outside of the nostril. The middle of the eyes line up with the outside corner of the mouth. These are all more or less measurements, of course, and doesn't take into account individual variety or expression. Expression is one of those things that we're dealing with here, for example. I like to start with constructing the upper lid first. The upper lid sets the height and the depth that I'm after. The height can be set from the front, but I have to take a look from the side view in order to be sure of the depth of the eye. I tend to attempt to start in the middle of the upper lid or at whatever part is the furthest out, furthest forward from the side view. This can change somewhat depending on the gaze of your figure. Kronos is staring pretty much straight ahead here, right at us when we're in front of him. So the high point of the upper lid should be more or less in the middle. The lower lids are then placed and now we have the framework for the eyes themselves beginning to take shape. Now there's going to be a bunch of back and forth needing to take place. Tiny amounts of clay added, small movements of the tools. For the construction of the upper lid, I'm looking to break what can end up as a very generic shape into three straight lines. This is more of a concept than anything else and something that keeps me from creating this very generalized and simple arch shape, which we all recognize when it comes to eyes. There's a lot more to the upper lid, however, than that. And this is where having good reference really comes in handy. My reference is a blurry still of a singer from live concert footage. So it's not exactly the best. And I suggest that if you're new to this especially, you should get some better reference than that. An important note to make is that I do my best to make sure that the lids are not sculpted in a way where they are fragile. You'll see later why this is. In order to keep them strong and fairly solid, I keep adding clay in behind them, so each lid is not just a thin wall of clay, but more of a wedge. This keeps them sturdy, which I'll need in order for them not to move every time I bump into them, which at this scale can be quite often, especially if I've had some coffee. So the three lines I'm looking for are going to be a short line from the inside corner of the eye, then a longer line making up the majority of the upper lid, and a final shorter line taking us down to the outside corner of the eye. Of course, we don't create these mechanical lines like this, but thinking in this fashion will help you understand what is going on with the particular lid you are trying to sculpt. Reference is certainly your friend here. No need to reinvent or invent something that has already been solved that you can find reference for. But if you would like some simple rules that can help, here are some. Always use three lines for the upper lid and make sure the length of each line is slightly different. The high point of the upper lid usually sits somewhere around the pupil and the iris, as these are a slightly raised bump on the round surface of the eyeball and pushes on the upper lid. You can always take a note out of Michelangelo's book here and have the high point of the upper lid towards the inside of the eyeball, which is what I did, or the inside of the iris and pupil rather. Then you contrast that with the low point of the lower lid, which you place towards the outside of the iris and pupil. Remember, offsetting high points, which we've spoken about extensively lately. This is another example of how effective this technique can be and how repeatable it is all over the human body. Okay, so this brings us to talking about the lower lid. Like with the upper lid, we are going to think in straight lines, more as a concept to understand what's going on rather than in execution. No need to sculpt straight lines here and then make them slightly more naturally connected later. We're just going to sculpt them as best as we can to begin with, but we'll keep the concept in the back of our minds while we do it. 
With the lower lid, we'll use two lines instead of three. Observing your reference is of utter importance here. In my case, the line from the inside corner of the eye is longer than the second line, which takes us to the outside corner of the eye. As you can see, we end up with offsetting high points slash low points doing it this way, and it looks quite natural and appealing. Of course, as you might notice, we have disregarded the tear duct while thinking like this, as this would add a bunch of complexity and extra lines into the mix that we don't really need. And at this scale, sculpting tear ducts is, is barely a millimeter movement with the tool. At a larger scale, you would have to consider it a little bit more carefully, of course. With lids in place, I can begin to add the eyeball itself. Remember how I said I like the lids to be strong and durable? That's because now I don't want them to move too much on me. I'd like them to stay in place while I push the clay for the eyeball into the eye socket. A few important things to note here. The eyeball needs to feel round, of course. It is a round ball, after all. Make sure the eyeball doesn't appear flat. Keep the idea of a ball in your mind as you sculpt it and imagine it traveling back behind the eyelids and turning in space. This turn is going to be especially a lot more noticeable on the inside and outside corner of the eye versus the top of the eyelid and the bottom of the eyelid because the turn is broader from left to right versus up and down. So keep this idea of a ball in mind the whole time through while you're sculpting it. You don't necessarily need to sculpt the ball, but keep that idea in mind. Flat eyeballs are not flattering at all and have a tendency to read really poorly in sculpture in my opinion. Once the clay is in place, I like to carve out the iris and pupil. In this scale, I prefer to carve it out. In larger scales, you can sculpt each side of the eyeball separately a little bit more easily. Things are quite small here, as you can see, and so it's easier to carve it out, or at least I find it easier. The theme of this sculpture and how it's visually presented is pretty dark, as I'm sure you might have noticed. So I think I'm going to go for black eyes, dark eyes here, and so carving out a little dark hole that catches shadow is going to give the eyes this really menacing shark-like look, which I think fits the sculpture pretty well. Remember to give the lids proper thickness. Flat sculpture is one of the biggest crime we as sculptors can commit, and often you'll see very flat or thin eyelids. The edge of the eyelids themselves are particularly thick, and you should lean into that as it helps keep the work volumetric and full, if on a tiny and to some potentially at least, but not to me, an insignificant scale. Giving the lids proper thickness allows for something else as well. It by default forces a lot of attention to the eyes because of the contrast that's created and how quickly that contrast changes. The edge of the lower eyelid catches light while below that edge it's in shadow. The eyeball catches light towards the top and shadow towards the bottom. The bottom edge of the upper lid by the virtue of facing downwards and being thick catches a dark shadow while the majority of the upper lid is facing towards the light and catches a lot of light before it hits the brow ridge where we get a shadow again and then the top of the brow ridge we get another very strong light. All these changes in light and dark concentrated into this tiny area draws a lot of attention and together with the psychological aspect that eyes play in our sculpture people will automatically look at them already and by having all these quick changes in light and dark in a very tiny area, it draws even more attention to it, which only works in our favor. A final little tip for you in regards to the gaze of the eyes, something I didn't really manage to capture footage of for reasons of technical difficulties, as you might have noticed at the end here, we're only filming one eye. Make sure you step back when directing the gaze of the eyes. If your work is looking directly at you with both eyes while you are up close to it, it's going to look very cross-eyed the second you step a little bit further back. So consider where people are going to be observing your sculpture from or where you want your sculpture to look. Eyes have a lot of psychology associated with them, so it's important to carefully consider them when you sculpt. Eyes don't happen fast. Take your time. Make sure the setup of the skull is correct first before attempting eyes. 
It can be devastating to have to restart because your eye sockets were not at the proper width, for example, which is a pretty typical one, when you started the eyes. So take your time, be willing to spend a lot of time doing it, and put a lot of attention into it. Good luck. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, consider liking it and subscribing to the channel for more videos. I put out a new video every Thursday, so stay tuned for next week. If you want to support the channel, visit the link to my Patreon page in the description below the video to learn how. Until then, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.